In certain parts of the country, so-called shock incarceration programs remain that are designed to be even more hardcore versions of the prison experience, an experience I can't imagine undergoing for literally even a day. And the details of these programs are themselves pretty shocking. And joining us now to break this down, Kerry Blakinger, criminal justice reporter. Kerry, thank you for joining us on the Damage Report. Thanks for having me. So people who might not be familiar with these shock incarceration programs, what are they about? So the ones in New York, like the idea is that if you have three years or less left on your sentence, you can do this six month military style like boot camp type program and then you would get out early. Um, there, uh, you know, in, in theory, it's a way to sort of use tough love treatment um, for addiction. And, you know, there's a lot of running and being yelled at and uh, cleaning toilets with toothbrushes and that sort of thing. So that's the basic gist of it. And so, I, like philosophically, the, the idea is that what? That it's supposed to, in a very short period of time, instill discipline or a desire to never return to that sort of program? What's the, the sort of philosophical underpinning of this program as opposed to more traditional forms of imprisonment in the US? Well, what they'd like to tell people is that they're gonna break you down so they can build you back up again. And you know, what a lot of the people that I talked to that have been through these are telling me is that, you know, they didn't, they sort of forgot about the build you back up part. Um, but at the point that these started being like a thing in the mid 80s, uh, you know, we were sort of in the middle of the war on drugs ramping up. And I, I think that, you know, a, a number of experts and academics have posited that part of this was that it sort of fed into the, uh, you know, the appearances of like drug, drug war ethos and sort of the military approach to, a, you know, to combating addiction. So, you know, if we have a drug war, we will use army tactics to actually treat addiction, which is uh, not recommended. And so I guess my fear would be, um, we know that when you give people a lot of power, they can abuse it, cops do it all the time, prison guards do it. Um, now you have a program that's designed to be more shocking and intense. And so I guess the fears would be physical and verbal abuse. It seems like some of that is baked into the system. Um, do we know about uh, abuses in terms of going beyond humiliation, which sounds bad enough, but also physical abuse of these people? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reports of that, um, or I, I got a lot of reports of that. It's actually something that was really underreported on in part because uh, if you file, in, in order to file a lawsuit, you have to go through the grievance process. But if you file a grievance as an inmate, you risk getting kicked out of the program and then you would have to finish your whole sentence instead of getting out early. So if there's no lawsuits coming out of it, then that makes it harder for reporters to even know that there's a problem. And I noticed this was something that was really not being reported on a lot. Um, the, you know, there's tons of horror stories I got in just the you know couple dozen people that I talked to. You know, the men reported that they were being hit uh, on a daily basis. Um, there's one woman that told me that she, you know, another woman had been caught um, eyeballing the men like they were in a facility with both men and women. And if you were caught staring at the opposite gender, you'd get in trouble. And uh, as her punishment, they made her run around a bush and threw shoes at her while she did it. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of people saying that they were called useless crackheads and bad parents and, you know, made to wear cones on their heads. And, um, you know, in uh, before I became a reporter, I, I did time and I did time in New York. So that's where I first heard about these. And uh, when I was there, I, I remember meeting two girls who had just uh, just come from shock and told me that they'd been raped there. And, um, you know, they after they got raped, they were put in solitary confinement and um, they they did actually get released uh, pretty quickly after that. Um, but there's a whole, you know, the, there's a whole spectrum of abuse of abuses that I hear reported from these programs. And so I've read about you talking about some of your own experiences when you were in prison, and it certainly gives you a, you know, a, I would say a unique position to report on these sorts of issues because you yourself have experienced. I mean, you talk about what solitary confinement is like. That's something that, for the vast majority of people, is something that at best they have heard about, and in general have heard very little about. 
Um, and so I appreciate that perspective. Uh, as you talked about, the way that the system is set up is sort of designed to stop there being any accountability because people are too scared to actually speak up about their experiences. Um, you are shedding light on it. Uh, has there been any interest in, in the past or present from politicians about possibly reforming these remaining programs in the places where they, they continue? So the these programs are all in upstate New York in largely rural communities that really depend on prisons as you know as part of their economy. So I think there's a lot of resistance to anything that would involve closing these facilities. I mean there's typically been a lot of resistance to closing prisons in upstate New York. Um, but I'm I'm also not sure to what extent uh, uh, like downstate politicians are aware of what's going on. I'm not even sure to what extent most politicians in New York were aware of uh, of of the gamut of allegations that come out of these places because they weren't really heavily reported on. Yeah. Um, now, the Department of Corrections is uh, reevaluating the program at Willard, uh, which is one of the three facilities. So that could change a little bit. They could be uh, I you know, I. I'd been getting tips that they were going to eliminate the military component. They weren't willing to confirm that. All that I got was that, you know, they were reevaluating. They're not reevaluating the other two shock programs. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem like as of now there's a whole lot of interest in uh, lawmakers wanting to see these programs changed. But you know, they're they're just coming to the end of their session, and the story just ran. So, I mean, I guess it's a little early to tell. Yeah, and, and hopefully there will be pickup and uh, renewed focus on this. And, and, and for that, we certainly appreciate you, uh, you reporting on what's going on there. Uh, Carrie Blakinger, uh, thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.